Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I, my presentation is about uh, the question of uh, the relationship between the climate change and migration. And uh, my question is very simple. What do we know exactly? What are the sources we can rely on to uh, uh, deal with this uh, big issue? Well, uh, there are, uh, so my presentation is in French, but, my, but I shall speak in English. And, but as you know, uh, the academic English is but a variant of the academic French from the linguistic point of view. So uh, we may observe a huge uh, rise in the number of uh, research, uh, researches about this uh, nexus between uh, migration and uh, uh, climate change. It's uh, really impressive. And there is a methodological uh, challenge. Uh, the best studies I, I, I know are try to uh, establish a connection, a correlation between two kinds of data, data on uh, climate change. And uh, most of them, for example, the studies made by economists, are based on uh, uh, satellite, satellite uh, images, which show over time the evolution of uh, the, uh, the use of the, of the soil and uh, the crops and so on. And, uh, and the, uh, the second series of, uh, of data are the population change, uh, which come uh, essentially from uh, uh, censuses. But of course, the censuses uh, are, are the quality of the censuses is quite variable uh, according to the regions of the world. And uh, in order to be able to establish a correlation between these two kinds of series, you need first a uh, degree of, uh, uh, of uh, granularity, a granularity which is rather thin, uh, and you need uh, uh, a sufficient uh, period, a sufficient uh, uh, length of time. Well, let's say two decades, for example, two intervals uh, between the censuses, since the uh, um, standard uh, interval between two censuses is a uh, decennial interval, which has been, it has an American origin, it comes from the American Constitution, and then it has been uh, widespread, it has been uh, uh, recommended by United Nations, uh, etc. So when you succeed in uh, uh, making this, uh, in, compare, in making a comparison and an analysis of the two time series, uh, what do we uh, observe? What do we? Well, it's rather difficult. The, the, the results are not very convincing. It's very difficult to measure the direct incidence of the climate change on international migrations, uh, except, of course, for some island states, for example, in the, in the Pacific or something like that. Uh, Maldives, of course, are the, uh, the most famous example. But in fact, the idea that uh, climate change will uh, provoke will uh, uh, an international migration uh, is not uh, there is very few evidence about it. What we have is uh, evidence about indirect links uh, through aggregated variables through collective uh, uh, factors. So for example, uh, if the drought uh, worsens, uh, there is more urbanization. There is a positive correlation between urban urbanization and the rise of urban violence, for example. And we know by other studies that urban violence is one of the factors of the triggers of uh, uh, international emigration. Well, this kind of in indirect connection, which is not uh, uh, strictly uh, convincing. And so uh, some of these studies, uh, for example, Catherine Millock, a Swedish researcher uh, who works in, uh, in France, has shown that if the drought worsens, uh, there is the, the, the more the, the, the people become poorer and they have less resources to emigrate because it's important to remind that as a whole, if you look at the uh, world databases about migration, the big matrix 
which correlates uh, countries of birth with countries of residence. Uh, it's not true that the poorer a country is, the more migration there is. Uh, it is a hump um, uh, shape, the, the correlation shape. And so, of course, the, aspir the aspiration to migrate is strong uh, in a lot of countries. Even in France, 15% more or less of the population, French population, when you ask them, would you like to uh, live in another country on a permanent basis, say yes. Uh, so uh, the, the aspiration is not su sufficient. You have, you need some resources to migrate, a minimum of resources. And that's why the most important emigration rates you can observe in the world are countries like Maghreb, uh, Georgia, uh, Armenia, uh, uh, Mexico, etc., etc., who are precisely situated in the middle of the uh, development of the uh, of the human uh, index development. If you uh, scale of the countries with uh, uh, human development index on a, on a 10 bar uh, scale, all these countries have the most, for example, the Balkan countries is a very striking example. 20, 22% of the ex-communist Balkan countries live abroad, the population of these countries. And contrary to what uh, is said, constantly in the public discourse, this European desert, the uh, very low fertility rate of this country, 1.4, 1.3, something like that, does not attract people from outside. On the contrary, uh, the idea we have, this metaphor we have on that, uh, that the overcrowded nations will necessarily spill over and the crowded nation is completely uh, false. Uh, we have much more counterexamples and examples of this uh, liquid metaphor of uh, communicating uh, vessels, you know, this is... Uh, and so, uh, what Catherine Millock has demonstrated that, yes, if uh, in countries like uh, Niger or Chad, for example, uh, have... Uh, uh, experiment uh, a more severe drought than they already have, it will diminish the emigration rate instead of uh, encouraging it. So it's a paradox. So, and that explains, uh, justify the fact that most of the international organizations, uh, well, uh, prefer a, a fallback solution de repli, uh, which consists in uh, studying the impact of the mig uh, climate migrations on internal displacement or internal force displace displacements. And uh, I'll, sh I'll show you some example of the international uh, uh, structures which have been built in order to uh, assess this kind of, uh, of impact. And maybe another factor which explains uh, why uh, there is no uh, <laughs> very uh, striking, a very strong interest for uh, the idea of international migrants, uh, climatic international migrants, is the fact that there, we, there are very few countries which would be uh, were ready to welcome uh, such, uh, such migrants because it's not, uh, it doesn't correspond to the Geneva Convention, and the Geneva Convention is already fragile, and nobody wants to renegotiate the Geneva Convention. It's too, uh, it would be too, too dangerous for it. Some uh, uh, programs of relocation, relocation uh, are discussed uh, within, especially with the OIM, uh, the, the, the International Organization of Migration, IOM, uh, there is also the idea that uh, temporary protection could be given, etc. But uh, there are several uh, forums of discussion about it. But it would take uh, too many time to, uh, to discuss it. So uh, the relationship between migration, international migration, and climate is rather uh, complex. It's also something uh, uh, traditional. Uh, if you look at uh, the 19th century, 20th century, uh, in, uh, uh, in rural Europe, but also in Africa, in Asia, etc., what is 
it was a, a common uh, pattern that uh, migration was sort of insurance uh, for the populations to uh, counter the variability of the climate, to counter the volatility of the agricultural returns, and by several ways, or uh, multi-activity, pluri-activity. During one period in the year, they could, the people of the mountains, for example, could migrate to the uh, to the plains, to the cities, etc., or delegating one member of the family to uh, bring uh, additional resources in order to smoothen the uh, volatility of resources in this country. So the, the migration as an insurance, the migration as an adaptation to the uh, difficulties to the, uh, the, uh, raised by the climate is, is clear. And my, I began my career in, in Bolivia, in the Andes, in, uh, in Indian communities. And uh, I was very struck by the fact that uh, an important fraction of the population, local population, well, they had several strategies. One of the strategies was to diversify the parcels and to distribute the parcels along the ecological stages in order to uh, disperse the, the dangers. But the other strategy was also to migrate to La Paz, for example, in order to, to bring uh, an additional resources, uh, which was absolutely indispensable. So this is a classical, was it a climate migration? Was it? Uh, uh, is it voluntary? Is it forced? Is it it's very difficult to determine exactly uh, uh, the category of this uh, migration, which is rather classical? Uh, if I consult the existing literature about this question, one of the most uh, detailed uh, uh, Report I've, uh, I've discovered is uh, this one, Sandula Veresang's Vera Zinge from the Georgetown University. What we know about climate change and migration. And uh, uh, she concludes that it is too simplistic and inaccurate to suggest that climate change causes human movement. And I think that most of the presentation we've heard this morning uh, are on the same line. So, the reason is that many other causes uh, interact, political, economic, social, demographic. You see, uh, French is the same in, in language as English. <laughs> and uh, the selection bias of migrants, the selection at uh, the departure, the vulnerability factors, all these uh, kind of things are intricated. Well, so now let's look at, uh, have a look at uh, the institutions which are supposed to uh, uh, gather data about uh, forced uh, displacement. One of them is a joint data center on forced displacement, really recently created by the World Bank Group and the UNHCR. It's rather recent, has been uh, launched in, in uh, Copenhagen by, and financed by the Danish uh, government. And there are delegations in some uh, countries uh, in the Global South. And it is centered on 20 countries, uh, most vulnerable countries, uh, in order to facilitate, for example, to organize surveys on the vulnerability of, of people vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, climate uh, variability and so on. But they don't have in their database, uh, they don't take stock, really, of uh, the impact of climate migration, uh, on, on the climate change on uh, migration. Whereas, and if, for example, they have uh, an interesting uh, classification developed by the, the World Bank, classification of fragile and conflict-affected situations. And in this uh, classification, you don't find anything directly related to climate. Uh, now, a uh, more interesting institution for our purpose is uh, IDMC, Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, which has been created by the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, so uh, more than 20 years ago. It's one of the members of the task, of the task force on the uh, forced displacement, uh, created by the COP21. And the other members are HCR, Red Cross, uh, uh, um, IOM, and so on. 
But of course, you have all other panels in uh, Geneva, in, uh, in Norway, etc., uh, uh, which are also discussing. But what is interesting in this IDMC is the fact that you have they have a database online, uh, free access, and you can uh, download two uh, series of data: the conflict-induced displacement and the disaster-induced displacement. Donc les conflits euh, armés et les catastrophes. Uh, and so, they, are, they have several tools, uh, a platform which uh, tries to evaluate the risks of uh, the, 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 the probability uh, of a, a displacement due to uh, disasters. Uh, you can also, there are um, tools in order to make a graph of this. And uh, certainly the most interesting uh, instrument they have is uh, what they call the iDetect. It is uh, a data mining uh, procedure which analyzes systematically all, a, a lot of, well, thousands, every day, thousands of articles and reports on the uh, nature and the magnitude of uh, disasters. And so they identify all the, uh, the events uh, the extreme events, and they try to convert it into this uh, uh, database, uh, which is uh, uh, quite interesting. And the last tool they have is an analysis of, of course, all the images of uh, damage, destruction in the, uh, caused by uh, extreme events in areas which was not uh, easily accessible. So if they uh, as a whole, they, and I'm, I, I take this graph from their uh, uh, own presentation, they combine a, a vast, uh, uh, um, a vast sample of uh, our sources, uh, a vast spectrum of sources from uh, national local authorities, media, civil societies, so or the NGOs are here, international organization, the Red Cross or Red Crescent, private sector, etc. So this is a really uh, a quite impressive effort to gather, to collect information about the uh, existence and magnitude of uh, catastrophic events. So, if you look uh, at the... Uh, if you, uh, have a look to this, uh, their annual reports. It's rather, it's not always easy to read because, in fact, uh, you have to make a clear distinction, and the, the, the language they use is not very clear either. As a demographer, it's, it is my, my, my feeling. My, because the, you have a statistic about the new displacement in the year uh, Y, okay? And uh, but also a, a stock, and it takes stock of the total number of persons displaced at the end of the year. So this is a, exactly the equivalent of the distinction between uh, uh, flows and stocks in demography, or, of course, incidence and prevalence. But what is striking in this uh, kind of data is that the flows in one year are very often uh, more important than the stock at, at the end of the year, which seems rather, because in fact, uh, let's take an example. If you had huge floods in China, the Chinese authority uh, consider that all the people that have displaced in order to, to prevent the population from the predictable uh, flood is corresponds to this displacement. And then after the flood, the people uh, come back to their uh, housings. And so this kind of displacement uh, is uh, included in the calculation in the, in the census by the Chinese authorities. Well, once you have uh, and, and understood and uh, you are caught this, uh, the, 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 the way it is uh, classified, what are the results? And this is a graph of mine, but directly taken from, from the data. And I have uh, uh, superponed in, in two layers. Uh, the number is uh, millions, uh, millions of people, uh, and this is uh, uh, the données of stock, uh, data of stock data, uh, 
uh, due to conflicts, induced by conflicts, and the other by catastrophe. And you see that uh, despite all the efforts made to uh, analyze, to, to identify the forced displacement due to uh, environmental uh, events, it's more or less, it represents more or less one eighth of the total uh, number of displacement, more or less. This is a scale of the, uh, this is a classification of the, uh, this is a, the top 38, and this top 38 include 90% of all the world uh, total of uh, displaced persons, so it's rather uh, comprehensive. You see that Syria, Congo, Colombia, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, so you see all these countries in conflict. You, they don't include Venezuela. Venezuela is more or less more than 4 million people uh, who had to, to flee from uh, their country because it's not considered as a, a forced displacement. It's a, it's a, a choice made by the people, etc. So, of course, it's rather controversial. Uh, and, of course, Ukraine is not here because this is a, a stock taken uh, before uh, the, uh, uh, the conflict. The, the invasion, the Russian invasion. So, well, of course, the way uh, the data are gathered in these two kinds of events is not the same, but the, the, the effort made, especially through the eye detect system, uh, the, the determined system, to identify the number of displaced persons due to catastrophe is a huge effort. They employ more or less six or seven people at full time to work on this, which is uh, an important uh, resource, and uh, I envy them. Uh, and, uh, okay, so, uh, for example, let's uh, take the same data, and, uh, but classify them according to the uh, importance of uh, catastrophes, of uh, disasters, uh, uh, events due to disaster. Afghanistan, India, Pakistan. Afghanistan, if you look at the uh, country report, it corresponds to some floods, uh, which were very important in 21. So all these data from one year to another are rather volatile. Huh? It's uh, really uh, sensitive to the, uh, well, uh, the events unexpected events that occurred in this year. And if you look, for example, at uh, the 20, uh, uh, 2019, uh, it will be uh, quite different. But strikingly enough, the countries in which we have these disasters also in part correspond to the countries with uh, important uh, uh, conflicts. Well, it's, of course, this kind of database raises more uh, questions than it asks, uh, uh, that it gives, uh, answers, it gives answers. Uh, according to the last, uh, to the last summaries, to the last re annual reports, uh, in uh, 2020, there were 59 million people uh, internal, uh, with this status of uh, internal displaced. Uh, so the conflicts, I already uh, told you that it was uh, uh, one eighth uh, of, the, of this population were uh, displaced by uh, environmental events. Uh, some, uh, well, one month ago, not even one month ago, they published the last uh, report and the number has raised to uh, 59 million, due essentially to Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, Myanmar, uh, uh, Birmania. And of course, uh, Ukraine is still not uh, included in this uh, a report on the year uh, 2021. Uh, this is uh, uh, the report, last report, published in May uh, 22. And this is a map they publish in uh, their report or in the, in the press uh, uh, conference. And of course, uh, the, the, 
the choice you, you, you make and the, the size your size you give to each uh, uh, figure to each uh, uh, circle produces a, uh, an important uh, visual effect. Uh, you don't see the, the limits of the countries. Do you see them? No? no. Ah, okay. So, uh, Asia is on the right, of course. <laughs> Africa <laughs> and Europe is, uh, well, I'm sorry for that, but uh, it's just, just uh, yes, it was a, a little gray, a very discreet gray uh, area, but you can, uh, you can see the, the name of the countries. So, for example, uh, China, of course, is, is quite uh, impressive, the number of displaced persons in China, but this is due to the famous flood I was uh, talking about. Uh, and, of course, compared to, because these are absolute numbers, it's always difficult for a demographer to accept absolute numbers uh, if you consider the fact that uh, the different countries have very, very different population. And so, uh, compared to the uh, 1 billion, uh, 300 million, or 400 million uh, people you have in China, it's nothing. It's a very, very low uh, figure. And if you look proportionally to the, the population, the importance of displaced persons, the first country in the world is Vanuatu, the former uh, New Hebrides. It was a condominium, a French-English condominium, uh, maybe you remember, until the, the 70s. And why Vanuatu? Because Vanuatu is a volcanic archipelago. It's a, they are constant. Uh, lava uh, streams, uh, uh, um, uh, eruptions, volcanic eruptions, and so on and so on. It's a very specific situation. Uh, well, so, but you can see that uh, uh, of the conflicts in, uh, in, uh, in yellow are very much concentrated, but not exclusively, on, uh, on Africa. You have also, of course, a part of them uh, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, in southern, in southeastern Europe. Here is a zoom on this, uh, the same data. Maybe it's more visible. Okay, and here is Africa. Well, um, this kind of uh, data. Uh, they also publish uh, a, a balance of uh, uh, a summary of the, uh, the, the relative importance of uh, conflicts uh, continent by continent, or region by region. And uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is, of course, uh, the most uh, represented region. But uh, I will just uh, uh, finish on the, my last slide on the typology they use to uh, identify the natural uh, hazards. Uh, and uh, you can see that the geophysical, it's, it's a, a, an interesting question. Huh? Uh, uh, earthquakes um, have nothing to do with climate. Earthquake may have an impact on climate. A very important earthquake in the in the past, and then volcanic er eruptions uh, may have an uh, volcanic eruption, in particular, may have an, an impact on climate. But in fact, this you, you should make a distinction between environmental migration and climatic migration. Climate migration is a, a subpart of the uh, uh, whole environmental migration. And uh, the relative importance of uh, this, uh, every kind of, uh, of, of migration uh, can be represented this way. Uh, so these are the new movements uh, registered in uh, this year, in the, in, the last, in, the, in the last year. And uh, they have uh, classified under the uh, climate uh, uh, rubric section, the storms, uh, floods, uh, uh, white fires, droughts, uh, uh, ébouillement, uh, uh, avalanche, uh, etc. And uh, surprisingly enough, the heat waves, canicule, represent a very slight fraction of all this uh, 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 classification. Well, this was a modest presentation. I just wanted to uh, 
give you an idea of the sources we have. But the main conclusion I, I'm drawing from this is that by now, uh, migration is due to conflicts, to war, to uh, foreign interventions, etc., are much more important than, than migration is due to climate. There is a myth about the massive uh, climate migration that we uh, would expect in the, in the, in the next decades. Uh, there is, and it would be very much interesting to, to, to make the history of this myth, uh, to study this myth, why it has, uh, it is so easily widespread, why the public opinion and the, uh, whatever the, 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 the political streams are so attached to this idea that we'll have to expect massive and massive migration. It, because, they, in fact, they, they don't, don't have any idea of the order of magnitude of migration that already exists. Uh, it's not the poorest of the poorest uh, who migrate more, and not at all. Uh, and so we have a false idea of the global structure of uh, migration uh, moves. Thank you. Thank you.